worry when you go to sleep at night then you have a problem then you're not going to last long in the business i think i think you have to you have to get over those things obviously you have to deal with all the problems but when you can't let go of the problems once you're away then then there's a concern that you're not going to mentally last in the last in the game if you go to bed worried over over risk every evening then that's not healthy find a way to deal with it during work hours the glory of uh, spending 80 hours a week and uh, in the office and being there evenings and weekends well that's something you know that's an illusion you cannot get over once you get to a certain age been there and done that and glad i don't have to do that again before we find out who's on today's show i just want to mention that today's episode is brought to you by urex And given all the current market volatility relating to US rate hikes and the slowdown in China, you'll find some very useful ways of hedging your portfolio risk if you visit the Eurex website. This is Andreas Klemmer, Chief Investment Officer at ACES Asset Management in Zurich, and you're listening to Top Traders Unplugged. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. That is the key trick. Sure. How do you get that? Sure. No, that's fine. Let's let's talk a little bit about sort of more the usual topics that I would uh, discuss with with my with, with the managers on, and it you know it, it somewhat relates to how you then build a strong organization, and and let's assume that you overcome some of these financial uh, uh, challenges that you just mentioned. Uh, but in your case, I wanted to ask you sort of more. Uh, Uh, focus on 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 research because that's something that you've done a lot of now investors they will put a lot of emphasis on the research capability of a manager when making their selections Uh, and clearly research is a large uh, to large extent the heart of a systematic manager but you also uh, you know you also have a, a a an allocator or an investor hat to put on so if we put that on for a little bit now what kind of research and capability do you look for when you are looking to allocate money away? Mm. Well, okay, limiting to systematic managers uh, because we, um, sure. we, as you know, we, we allocate to a lot of different things. Uh, something I I shouldn't say on a public podcast because that means the amount of calls and emails I'm getting is going to increase from various oh, managers. Oh, most definitely, Andreas. Yes. Uh, don't worry, I have an assistant to forward them to. <clears throat> anyway, what I look for? Well, first of all, I very, very rarely invest in a manager I don't know about before. Sure. That would take something exceptional. Uh, even the ones I know, well, obviously I meet them many times first. Uh, managers usually come to our office uh, to, to present. That's actually how I got to know a lot of the interesting people in the business, uh, Nicole and, and other people like that. You look at not only what they present, the, their real results, of course, and you look at the personalities. Is this an individual you trust with your money or not? Uh, obviously, before you actually pull the trigger on, on making a larger allocation, you need to go down to a much deeper level. You need to go down to the, or do all your proper due diligence. Uh, if you're an institutional investor like us, well, then you're expecting to see a DDQ, for instance, which obviously a, a newer manager probably won't have. Some institutional managers might not either. Maybe I should explain, a DDQ is a uh, due diligence questionnaire. It's a standardized way of, of answering a lot of questions. Let's say the, uh, the uh, hedge fund equivalent of um, an FAQ on the internet. It's usually a large booklet. What is it, 100 questions? It feels like it's going to fill it in anyway. <laughs> 
Yes, it's uh, there is a lot of yeah. questions there for sure. Which of, which of course you have to you have to verify because anyone can write a document, right? But in this document should be enough information that you can verify, you can figure out the answers to most important things, and you save a lot of time if someone has a DDQ ready. So, am I hearing you? Right. When you say that it's more the individual, I mean, usually a lot of firms are founded by one or two people. And, and so for, is it more for you, the, the, the key individual, rather than the fact that they might have, you know, 50 PhDs on, 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 on their staff? I mean, what's, and so I'm trying to, yeah. I'm trying to gather from an institutional investor like you, you know, sure. what, what is important, so to speak? The principle of principles are of very high importance because mm. if you don't like them, then it doesn't matter how good the rest of the thing is. Mm. You need to figure out who they are, can you trust them, and how do they run their business. I find some, even among the ones I actually like, I find some really extreme divergences between managers and how they are as individuals, how, how they run the business. They have often very, very different views on things uh, mm. compared to each other. And yet, they need to find out what really fits into what you want to do and who do you want to work with. Sure. You can also very quickly sort out many people who you just don't trust. You meet them once and you, you count your fingers or they leave the office, right? So, um, no names, but uh, quite often I meet people who I would never do business with again. Sure. Or at all, rather. Sure. So, personal contact is important. Uh, if the fund seem to be too important or too self-important to deal with you properly, then, well, why would you want to deal with them? Yeah. So you, you need to see how, who are they, what have they accomplished, how long have they been in business, uh, are the results real, are they showing you uh, simulated results, are they showing actual results, what's the difference, what kind of fees do they have, what kind of structure do they have, what's their, what's their legal structure, are they, uh, are they an offshore, offshore fund in a, in, a, in a Donald Duck country where where you can't sue them if something goes wrong, or are they onshore in your local jurisdiction? You need to look at all of these kind of details. Sure. Well, let's stay with your investor hat on for a little while and talk about something that you just mentioned, which is, you know, uh, performance, more, more specifically track records. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, I mean, there are firms that has 30, 40 years of track record, there are some people who have five years of track record. I mean, what's important to you as an investor when it comes to the track record and, and also uh, maybe keeping in mind that people who have been in business for a long time obviously will have made changes to the model anyway and, and therefore it can be a little bit difficult to, yeah. to just look at that. Uh, uh, so, But since you do a lot of testing, you do a lot of simulation, you run a lot of things, uh, you might be in a good position to, to have some views yeah. on this. No, but you have some, uh, it's an interesting point there, because you say some shops have been around for you know, 30 years or something, and they're now large organizations with a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of staff. Um, I think you got my point before, that I'm, I'm a little bit allergic to large organizations. So that, that might not <laughs> sure. be the best thing. Sure. Uh, when organizations grow to a certain point, no matter how good they were to begin with, they tend to, not always, but they tend to become, well, bureaucratic corporate machines. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen to everyone, but there's always a risk, and that's something to look into. Mm. Maybe they were started by a great entrepreneur. He did excellent things for 20 years, but you know what? Maybe now he's just a board of director and is run by a whole bunch of of, uh, of, of, uh, of directors who are not owners, mm. who run things differently. You have all the project managers and the, uh, the bureaucrats stepping in. It's happened. A few uh, a few funds have even closed in the while, uh, after a while because of these kind of problems. Uh, others are struggling because of this. I'm sure you know some of these shops are wrong. Sure. So that's it. Doesn't have to be a negative thing, but it can be. Okay. Um, of course, if the same people have been running it for a very long time, maybe that's a great thing, and maybe it means that they want to retire soon and want to leave it, and then what? So it's just things to look into. Never assume that is great because it's been around for a long time or that it's bad because it's been around for a long time. Uh, a five-year manager might be great. Could be, it could be an excellent manager that's been around for five years. Of course, you have to verify how has it been managed for, for five years. And uh, if this is mostly a, a retail account of his own money, I would be more skeptic. Uh, 
doesn't mean I would have to dismiss it, but that would be a larger hurdle, of course. Uh, if this person has been running a, a proper audited hedge fund uh, with a proper custodian, a proper uh, administrator, all of these things for five years, well, that's a decent track record. I mean, five years uh, running a proper business, that's not bad. Sure. So. Yeah, no, I agree. Just speaking about performance, but in a trend-following context, I, I just wanted to hear your um, view on that, since you obviously, uh, I can say that, I guess, have a soft spot for trend-following, even though you have other strategies. Um, I, a question I get from 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 listeners from time to time, and, and actually also from uh, potential investors that I deal with in my, in my day job, and that is that... People think that trend following perhaps um, have performed poorly since uh, the financial crisis because too much money has gone into that strategy uh, since the great year of 2008. As a practitioner, what, what, you, what, you, what do you think about that? Well, I would say since 2008, there's been good years and bad years. Overall, most funds made very good money since then. Um, most funds beat equities, they beat most normal, say, uh, classic type of strategies since then. But, you know, it's, it's a favorite pastime of journalists at times to write about when, when trend following stops working again. Sure. And it all it takes is a few months, even a year, that they make the great, head, great headlines. It's always come back. It, certainly we don't have the same the same performances in the 80s anymore, or even the 90s. Sure. And I don't think it's realistic to expect that. But what we've seen is it still outperforms uh, traditional asset classes. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Now, um, I, I actually never ask uh, people about this, um, but since you're a little bit uh, wearing a number of different hats, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, we as managers often think about various statistics and, and how to measure uh, how good a model is, how good a, a program is. And I'm wondering, and I'm sure you do the same when you do your own uh, strategies, but also as an investor, uh, I'm sure investors have uh, their favorite statistics that they look at. What have you found in in the world of, of many, many different statistics that seems to be, um, you know, meaningful and reliable to to look at when evaluating a strategy or a manager? Well, it depends very much what I'm looking for. Um, I think the difference is, the perception is that we're always looking for the best thing, but you're never really looking for the best thing. You're looking for something that fits what you need at the moment. Take an example. Maybe you come to me and you want to pitch a new, a new fund that has brilliant return for a long time, real money, you have this enormous shop ratio, all of these things. You combine these 10 strategies that have negative correlation to each other and therefore you have this, this great track record over time. That might not be what I'm looking for. Sure. As, as, a, as a chief investment officer, I, I'm probably looking for a building block that fits into my other building blocks. Mm -hmm. Someone comes and says, I, I have the perfect thing because I combine all of these things. Well, you know, combining these things is my job, not your job if I now have the chief investment officer hat on. Sure. And you find the same thing with most institutional allocators. They're not looking for the investment strategy to rule all investment strategies. They're looking for building blocks. Mm. We're buying Lego here. So the question is, what, what are you looking at at the moment? Well, probably you're looking for something that has a certain profile in comparison to your current portfolio. Therefore, you're evaluating both products and, and new models if you build them yourself. On the merits of how do they compare to what you have at the moment? How do they fit in? Because probably you're not looking at replacing everything you have with this new thing, right? Sure. This is a portfolio component. I mean, if you manage, if you're the asset manager, you're, you're, the, you're the fund manager, you have all these positions behind your fund, right? But when you come to me and you pitch your fund, then your entire portfolio is just, just a portfolio component for me. It's just, it's just one component out of many. So I think that that's a difference. Uh, me and I think most others in this situation, we don't look at who's got the best sharp ratio, who made the lot, most money last, last year. That, that's, it's a simplified view. That's not how it works. Well, let's jump to the uh, to the next uh, subject, which is more sort of the the trading strategies. So and I need to ask you to to take your investor hat off and and put on your 
your your trader hat or your whatever we call it. Yep. Done. Um, done. Good. Um, now, you know, obviously, as as people will have uh, realized now, you run a, a number of different strategies: uh, classical managed futures, some some stock uh, only uh, strategies. So, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you sort of from a from, and you can pick one of you can talk about both of them it doesn't really matter but just sort of generally speaking how you've kind of organized uh, these strategies and and what are sort of the some of the key design features that you've focused on because you know building these things is not strictly like you know following a recipe of a cookbook i mean you have there are some common ingredients but you still have to put in your own mm-hmm. you know your own choices so so how have you done it in, 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 you know, in your own trading? Well, when you say my own trading, uh, that opens for... Interpretation. Uh, that, that opens, <laughs> the, the question, uh, you mean trading my own money or trading client money or trading accounts that are combined? Okay, it's, it's I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the strategies that you would uh, allow external money to be involved okay. in. Yeah. Good, because my point is, once you're talking about mandates that where external clients are involved, either there is one single client behind it, and then that client's wishes and needs is the major factor. You never just say, hey, take it or leave it, this is my model, right? And you discuss with the client, if now this is a single client, a single account, right? And maybe the client has many different things, maybe he has a large amount with us, uh, we do many different things, it can vary between uh, investments in the American fracking business to, as you know, we're heavily into merchant financing, for instance, uh, combining with uh, with systematic strategies. So it depends a little bit. What is he looking for? What kind of kind of risk? We can have what kind of profile? So I'm uh, probably you, I'm probably thinking about sort of your systematic strategies mm-hmm. because that's really been exactly. the theme of our exactly. conversation. Yeah, exactly. no, I, I, I get you. I, I yeah. just want to say that you have a mark. You have sure. a. Um, a marketing factor in as well, especially if, if you have the other type, which would be a collective scheme of some sort, a fund or other collective uh, investment. And in that case, of course, uh, the um, the marketing attractiveness of, of the strategy has to be a factor. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if I do whatever I want with my own money, then <laughs> it might look different. Sure. It doesn't mean better or worse, but you have to take it into account. Now, how do you combine it? Well, or how do you how do you design it? Well, if it's something that external investors can come into, especially um, really outside money, which might be unknown people even, sure. um, then it needs to be clear and explainable. No one wants to buy a black box system. Uh, you don't say, look at my brilliant returns, now just do what I, you know, just, just put the money in and don't ask questions. They, they, you can't run a business like that anymore. Sure. So you need clear, explainable, uh, you need to have a concept which anyone can get. Mm-hmm. Now, personally, I prefer to explain everything. I mean, why, if someone is interested, and frankly, very few people are, but if someone comes and says, well, maybe they're going to invest a million and maybe not, but can you explain the rules? And sure, come sit by my desk, I'll show you what we do. Why not? As opposed to, for instance, if you have an account with a systematic account with, with just in house money, maybe you combine many different types of models, as I said, uh, the way it often makes sense to do mathematically. But my experience, it doesn't make for a good product to sell if you combine too many things in one uh, in one product in one one account. Right. It right. doesn't become explainable anymore. Sure, sure. And and would you say generally then taking this more pure pure approach, um, does does that mean that you so so today I guess you you do run a systematic uh, trend following strategy and you do run a systematic momentum yep. for stocks. Sure. Yeah. So, so in 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 terms of that, uh, we've talked a little bit about, and I, I know your books talk about, you know, um, uh, you know, entry signals and 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 how to aggregate uh, signal generation and and so on and so forth. Um, I guess there are three things that often comes to mind when you think about what makes a trend following uh, system successful. If I use that as an example, it's obviously where you enter it's uh, where you exit but it's also how you manage the risk along along the way and um, and that lends itself to sort of the the position sizing uh, as as being um, you know quite quite important you can talk about the signal generation if you want but i mean i was interested in knowing a little bit more about what you have found for your own programs 
to be important when it comes to position sizing and 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 also whether you think this is actually quite important in in the uh, in the determination of the success mm -hmm. uh, i would say position sizing you need to have a model that makes sense first of all um you mentioned my uh slightly provocative <coughs> post uh, blog post now and then uh, i think i had one there a while ago about I, uh, it's, it's just an, an easy target. I was just uh, writing some some things about the so-called money management strategies that you, you find so many books about. Okay. Uh, I haven't most, read that one, so go ahead and well, indulge us. Essentially, this is all of this uh, you know, pyramiding and uh, whatever else, this uh, models on how you change your, your position size based on recent performance. Mm -hmm. That seem to be the basis on that on those theories. And for me, that doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. Uh, let's say you, if you, if you buy a position today, you have uh, great gains uh, in a week or two, and then because you're now, well, quote unquote, playing with the with the bank's money, right? So now you increase your your position, you you, so you double your position size because you made a lot of money. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you have a high a higher risk just because you had a good run? I mean, the the last week's performance probably doesn't impact the probabilities going forward the next week. So why would you have so much higher risk on? Uh, I use there are different models. Okay. Actually, I always say what I use is is quite common models in the business, but quite different from what you read in most retail trading books. I prefer to have some variation of uh, of volatility parity slicing. You look at some sort of volatility measurement. Which one is for this discussion also not very important, but you can use something as simple as ATR if you like. Sure. Then you allocate a certain risk. If you want to use volatility as a, as a proxy for risk, of course, but I'll I say it's close enough, mm -hmm. and you take position based on that. The only problem is, of course, that volatility is not static, and neither is your portfolio value. So, if you have long-term positions, you need to, um, at certain intervals or, or certain um, threshold levels, rebalance your positions and reset them to whatever risk you would like. It doesn't mean that you have you 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 buy when you make money or you sell when you make money or vice versa, but rather that you're, you're targeting a certain risk level of if that changes for whatever reason, your current risk, you need to keep track of what risk did you want to have here and adjust your position size back to that. Of course, that's a position level, but as I like to stress as well, the most important thing is on the portfolio level. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the, what you mentioned here with the entry signals and the exit signals and the position size, this is all position level. I would say the, for the systematic models, diversify systematic models in a way that trade many markets and many instruments, every single position is quite irrelevant in the end. Uh, it's not the result in an individual position that matters, only the end result on the portfolio level. So that's also a mistake I see quite often, that is overly focus when you develop, when people develop, develop, develop trading models, that they focus on the, on the position, model, on position level. But the only thing that matters for you at the end of the year, right, is how much how much gains or how, what, what happened on your, on your whole portfolio. Who cares if you lost on half of your positions or even more if you made money and at good risk-adjusted values on the, on the whole portfolio. Mm. So risk management on the, on the uh, risk management and risk allocation on the, on the portfolio level is where you should focus. And is that very different between the two types of models that you've written about now in your two books, the trend following classical trend following model and the trend uh, or not trend, sorry, the momentum model for for mm -hmm. equities is, is the portfolio level and the way you allocate risk on that uh, very different? In a way, yes. Uh, when you trade equities, you have to be aware that you're primarily, trend, you're primarily trading beta. Mm -hmm. That is the um, uh, the dependency on the, on the, on the index to, to to put it simply. Right. So you will always have very high dependency on what's going on in the, in the overall market, in the index. Um, therefore, your risk looks different. Uh, a long equity model will always, in a way, be a, uh, a relative model. You can't expect to have a, a great gains when the market is falling. It doesn't mean that it's either worse or better or that you make less money or more money, it's just different. You can't expect the same type of, or type of returns so that you can make money in any type of market, which you potentially can with futures. You won't, but potentially you can. Sure. Now, okay, so clearly position management and position sizing is important. Um, just from your experience, 
Um, exits, where people get out, where does that rank in, in your world as to uh, how successful a, a strategy uh, is? I'm, I'm inclined to say not very for the reason that we're still dealing on position level. Mm -hmm. As an example, uh, let me take a, a super simple example. Um, I mentioned before this uh, type of counter trend model I made for fun where, where you buy where trend following models exit. Yeah. Uh, I made a, a funny variation of that uh, in the beginning, mostly as a joke. Uh, it simply exits after 30 days, mm -hmm. no matter what. Sure. Nothing else. Who cares what happens between 30 days, take profits, we close our eyes uh, until then. That works great. So you have to look at a model like that, and uh, you look at that model, and you tell me that the, the exit is more important than the entry, and I'm, I'm not sure about that. Sure. Uh, it's hard to say anything absolute, which is the most important uh, overall for all trading models. Well, there's no such thing. It, it all depends. That's mm. the, bo the boring answer to everything is it all depends. Mm. And what about the environment? Meaning if you could measure the environment, because I think you use something you refer to as trend filters in your mm. recent book. And so I imagine that you could have something along those lines that at least, you know, uh, I have it on 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 uh, you know on 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 my website. I have you know a trend barometer that measures the environment for trend following strategies, and mm -hmm. and uh, and and obviously people are, are welcome to 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 look at that. Um, but do you find that a some kind of filtering or some kind of measure of the environment uh, to be part of a a strategy nowadays is is that required or or or, or not necessary? It's certainly helpful, in particular for, for equities, uh, to have something like that. You have to be aware of where the wind is blowing. It doesn't mean that you have to necessarily take a position in that direction, but you have some sort of, um, it, if you have some sort of trend filter, you have some sort of idea of where things are more likely to, have, to, to, to move in the, on, on a certain time horizon. Mm. Uh, it's the same thing whether you look at the market as a whole or whether you look at each market by itself. You have to be aware when you trade uh, you trade natural gas. You have to be aware of what's the what's the long, medium, and tall, medium and short term time frame uh, time frame trend on this at the moment. It doesn't mean you have to trade in the same direction, but you have to be aware of it. Mm. In terms of diversification, we've talked about that uh, a little bit. Um, for for the classical trend following, you feel it's very important that, uh, or, or it's very important for the strategy. Uh, that you have the underlying diversification. Where do you stand on sort of uh, the overall asset allocation among sectors then? Meaning, you know, do you need to allocate the same risk to every single market, every single sector? Can you be overweight in certain sectors? I mean, how do you how do you deal with that in your own systematic portfolio, trend following mm -hmm. portfolio? Um, with the risk of starting with it depends again, but uh, <laughs> it depends a little bit on what... What type of model? Uh, say you're looking at a, uh, an equity model, for instance, uh, you can, to some degree, ignore the, the sectors, but right. it, it, also, it also matter of which, which type of model you have. If, if your model has the potential of going into, say, 100%, I don't know, healthcare stocks, for instance, you probably want to, pre you probably want to prevent that. Sure. So for some type of models, maybe you want to have some sort of, of uh, sector restraints. Uh, I would say it's, it's a bit too far to look at uh, tracking error and that type of approach. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the mutual fund way of doing things. But some sort of sanity filter, let's say you, you, if you apply, for instance, the, the ranking model I use in the um, latest book, and if you apply that on, uh, say, instead of S&P 500, you apply it to MSCI World Stocks, uh, maybe you come up with that you should now have 85% of your stocks in Japan. Well, then you have to wonder, do you really want to do that? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but it's something to consider if you really want to allow those things to happen. For the futures side, I think it's less of a concern. And futures models often depend on deliberately taking corner risks. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, you make the, the really big returns on corner risk. What do you, how do you define corner risk? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, corner risk, yeah, basically uh, high risk concentration in a particular area. Okay. So let's say... Uh, what if, for instance, most things are not trending, but the crude oil is dropping heavily, and you're short, you short the crude futures, you're short the the, uh, the gas oil, the gasoline, you short the heating oil, you short the whole complex, massively correlated. But you make money on all sides for a while, 
suddenly you take a hit on all of them and you exit. Mm. This is a necessary evil of uh, diversified trend following, I believe. Mm. There are probably some smart people out there who figure out ways around it. But um, even if you have to take the corner risk like that, my experience is that you, you'll make money from it in the end. Sure. Now, I, I, I want to go to the next topic, uh, which is risk management. Before I do so, I, I just have a couple of of sort of uh, questions. And one is, we've talked a lot about momentum trading, counter trend and, and trend following. And I'm, you may even do more, more, more strategies like that. Um, uh, but I have just one simple question. If you could only choose one to trade, which one would you feel most comfortable trading? Trading. It's like choosing between your children, isn't it? Uh, well, I only have one. <laughs> so that's easy. Yeah, true. Uh, I was about to give you the yeah, boring answer that the, the most profitable things we're doing is actually outside of, of, uh, of systematic strategies. But uh, anyhow, you want to hear about systematic strategies, so therefore, uh, let me say, normal trend following is, is on futures probably has the best potential. Uh, if I only did one, one type, I would say go, go very long term, that is very slow trend following. Right. Uh, which is... Over the long run, usually the best one. You've seen, uh, you know, as well, some of the, the more famous managers have been on a long time mm -hmm. running very, very long-term trend models that uh, they make them seem, seem like heroes some year and lunatics other years. And in the end, despite people occasionally seeing them as lunatics, they tend to come out as winners after, after enough time. Sure. Sure, sure. Now, of course, now that you bring that up, it, it, it sort of re reminds me that in your latest uh, book uh, about trading uh, equities, uh, you actually suggest, and I know the day, uh, the day is completely irrelevant, but you actually suggest to trade every Wednesday. All right. <laughs> so, I, had good, I had a good reason for that. It's a 20% it's a, it's a probability of being the right day, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but what, what you're saying is, Uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. Are you saying you should run your systems every day, but using very long-term parameter sets, or you should actually just run a trend-following model once a week and, and not worry too much about what happens in between? Um, I have both kinds, actually. But uh, look at something like my implementation of this, uh, as I mentioned, this 12-month momentum model. Well, it, it checks a signal once once a week. Right. Not weekly data, because I why not use... Sure. High frequency when you have it, right? It just only trades once a week and then checks the value a year ago and uh, yesterday, and that's mm. it. Mm. So that model performs very well, and uh, there's some practical uh, problems with running it, but it's a very nice theoretical model. Sure. sure, um, sure. As for the book, by the way, to, to mention that as well, um, could be could be good to mention that to a wider audience. Uh, When you write a book, you always have some sort of regret afterwards. You realize, I should have done something different, right? <laughs> As I said, the first one, I should have simplified the model more. The second book, well, I should, in retrospect, have decreased the, um, uh, the trading frequency a bit. Mm -hmm. See, living where I live, uh, you're in the same country, so you know we don't have to deal with uh, capital gains taxes, even for, for private uh, trading. Uh, as investment professionals, we certainly don't have to deal with it. Uh, we're dealing with very low commissions and so on. Therefore, trading frequency is not a big deal. Sure. Uh, for the book, uh, given that a lot of people who read the book are located in countries where they have capital gains taxes to deal with, uh, even this uh, so-called short-term capital gains taxes in some countries, uh, they might have high commissions and so on. Mm. If you, instead of uh, trading weekly, or are trading monthly, you get almost the same and much lower, almost the same theoretical performance and much lower uh, trading costs, uh, much less issues with uh, with capital gains taxes. So yeah, I should probably have done, in retrospect, I should probably have, have done monthly in the book instead of weekly, but <laughs> well, I should do a post on that. Um, sure. Yeah. Now, jumping to the risk management side, how do you define risk? What's what what is what is valid risk in 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 your opinion, so to speak, when you're running these strategies to look at? It all depends on how how deep you want to go. I think Whatever you like that. You I think you like that term, Andreas. It all depends. It all depends. It does. Uh, reality tends to be more complex than <laughs> than the theories usually. 
And besides, I'm always careful talking about risk in public since I have a, a wife who is a professional uh, risk analyst, uh, risk risk controller, risk manager, and so on. And sure. So I, I should be careful using the right terminology there. <laughs> How far should you go? It depends on who you are and what kind of situation you're you're. You're in. But if you let's talk about. Well, let's talk. Yeah, let's talk about how you do it. Not not your private uh, yeah. money, but for when you manage money for 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 clients. What kind of risk measures do you use? You know, standard deviation, valued risk, margin to equity, sure. Sure. stuff sure. like that. Yeah. Sure. Do you sh- exactly all, all all of the above. Yes. Of okay. course. Of course. And then the question is, of course, how do you how do you use this and lose this in the end? Uh, I know some funds, for instance, that use um, value at risk to, to uh, allocate positions and they look at uh, marginal value of risk of new positions to the portfolio and so on. And yeah, I don't really, that gets, it gets too complicated and I haven't seen, for me, the benefit. I can see the logic and uh, I, I can certainly see how that fits some, especially larger organizations. Also, it gets, these kind of things, running these kind of models gets much more important if you have a large staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if you have if you have a portfolio where you have one or two primary managers who are aware of every single position, they look at it every day. The need then for expensive risk systems, the need to have a MSCI Barra system or or a Suncorp system, all of these things, uh, it decreases a lot because you understand the risk anyway. Sure, you can build your own things even in Excel if you have you know, just one or two or even five portfolios and a small staff. Mm. Once you have 20 people or more looking at it, well, you need some sort of way of aggregating risk on a company level, and you need to follow up on a on a whole different, a whole different type of methodology. Are you a believer in stop losses, meaning that every single trade should have a stop loss, or do you manage the risk of loss in in a different way yourself? Uh, generally, I'm against I'm against the concept of Every single system should have anything, dot, dot, dot. Um, for some type of, of, of trading approaches, I use stop losses. For mm-hmm. others, I don't. For equity markets, for instance, I, I tend not to have stop losses in a, in a traditional way. I have other ways to measure when a position should be rotated out, in, replaced by something else, or closed down, but not a traditional type of stop loss. And for some futures models, I find stop loss to be absolutely vital. Mm. Not all, but for some models, uh, especially this kind of um, this kind of counter trend models, I find that the um, there's a higher importance of of, uh, of a stop loss since you're actually going in in the middle of your buying in the middle of selling pressure, for instance. And if sure. this is actually something real, it could be a big move. So different models would require different different portions of that. Yes, it all depends, doesn't it? I guess it does. <laughs> Now, drawdowns, uh, Andreas, have you found anything to kind of set expectations with investors in terms of, of drawdowns? I mean, when you look at a certain strategy, and again, I'm referring to, you know, maybe your momentum stock trading, or it could be your traditional trend following trading. I mean, is there anything as a guideline that you found uh, is a good measure or good estimate of of, uh, of drawdowns? Because this is obviously one of the things that, that investors uh, get very nervous about, and that is, uh, you know, when you when you start losing money. The most important thing is that investors understand what they invest in. They have to understand what kind of drawdowns are, are possible, what kind of drawdowns are likely, and of course, whatever drawdowns you simulated, your real ones are going to be larger, and most likely they're going to be coming around sooner than you think. Mm. And that's just that's just how things work, right? So the, the most important thing to retain investors is to have them as knowledgeable as possible about your strategy, about the risks, about the drawdowns. If you hope that you won't get a drawdown in a year or two and you don't properly explain the risks to a client, well, when that drawdown comes, it's not going to stay. So communication, as, as usual, is the, the, the main point. Sure. So, uh, but just going back to so the original question, is, I mean, is there anything from... You're doing a lot of simulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, do you just go with whatever your twenty-year simulation says, and then add another fifty percent, or or have you found anything else that works in terms of estimating the the actual potential drawdown? Or do you not worry about that as long as you explain to investors that you know this is to be expected and 
these are the environments that we would expect these losses to occur? I mean, first you have to look at what was likely. And for that, you can use simulations. You look at the worst thing that happened before, assume something sure. a little bit worse will happen, and that's probably likely to happen. You see recovery periods, uh, how it handled those things. And always, as I said, always assume it's going to be worse than whatever worst thing you saw in the simulation. Mm. But then, of course, you have the scenario of something absolutely unexpected happens and it gets much worse than that. Mm. You have to have some sort of plan in place for what happens when the unexpected happens. Uh, what happens when you show up in the office one day and, uh, I don't know what, nuclear bomb went off, something huge happened and everything is just way off the charts. Mm. Now what? No one wants to think about it. We all have to think about it. We have to have some sort of plan for it. Mm. 2008 is, is a good example as well. Things happen that no one had plans for. And is that, in your opinion, where systematic trading really has its strength that, you know, it, there is always a plan, you know, every day there is a plan uh, as opposed to maybe a discretionary trader. I mean, is that really the, the crux of the matter? For a normal bad market, yes. I mean, take this week, for, for instance. This is great for systematic traders. I mean, win or lose, you know what to do, right? Sure. It, it was... From a market point of view, a bad week, but not not panic week in any sort. On the other hand, systematic traders without special plans, they, they have no answer for what do they do in, in say, uh, the, the autumn of uh, 2008. And yeah, you can look back and say that they did great, right? Mm -hmm. But classic models, many of them broke down in various ways, uh, especially the risk management got kind of insane on many of them that you didn't massively override. But there's even bigger problems coming up that no one ever thought about before. Mm. Like what do you do with all the cash? Sure. Suddenly, it's like you, it's a game of hot potato. Uh, no bank is safe. That was a perception in a way for a while. Mm -hmm. There was a couple of months, I think, I don't know, four or five months or something, where I spent every late afternoon figuring out which, which bank is the safest one for the next 24 hours. And then we move money that we really need to have cash on hands, uh, on, on fund accounts, client accounts, move, in, move them in with the 24 hour depots between different banks. And that's, that was a stressful period. Because obviously if you just left the cash on your account and run your trend following model and sit back and watch, well, maybe you show up one day and your brilliant strategy is blown up because your bank went bust and you lost all your cash. Mm -hmm. And guess what, 75% of your fund was in cash and now you're dead, right? These kind of things you have to have, if, if not before 08, it's kind of forgivable if people didn't have plans for these things after, uh, before 2008 because it was unimaginable before. But now we know that anything can happen. Plan for it. And is this the kind of risk that would keep you awake today? And, and I don't mean necessarily that you think that any, you know, any bank will go bust tomorrow, but I'm just curious, you, you systematize you know, a lot of your trading um, so are there anything that you worry about when you go to sleep every night uh, with, 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 when it comes to risks in, in your trading? Something that you accept that you can't, um, you know, program? If you worry when you go to sleep at night, then, then you have a problem. You're not going to last long <laughs> in the business, I think. I think you have, to, you have to get over those things. Obviously, you have to deal with all the problems, but when... When you can't let go of the problems once you're away, then then there is a problem. Uh, I mean, then there is a concern that you're not going to mentally last in the last in the game if you, if you if you go to bed worried over over risk every evening. Then that's not healthy. That's sure. not healthy. That is, find, yeah. find a way to deal with it during work hours. Uh, the glory of uh, spending 80 hours a week and uh, in the office and being there evenings and weekends, well, that's something, you know, that's an illusion you cannot get over once you get to a certain age. Been there and done that and glad I don't have to do that again. Sure, sure, sure. Now, uh, I've got a couple of topics left uh, for, for our conversations that I just want to, uh, sure. to uh, run by you. I want to talk just a briefly a little bit about research i mean again you have these two hats uh, to to wear and so this time i'm going to ask you to maybe wear your allocator and investor hat again and 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 sort of when you sit down and you have your sort of research uh, you know brainstorming sessions with your with your colleagues um, and you're trying to decide you know what to invest in you know be it a manager a strategy etc cetera, etc cetera. so 
you know, a lot of these, you know, the way we make progress is often to ask sort of good questions. What are the questions you think investors should be asking when it comes to sort of the the overall asset allocation of their portfolios? It's a broad question. Hmm. Or how you do it. I mean, I, you know, it could be how how you do it when when you look at your portfolio of liquid strategies. I know you do some some other stuff, but what of the sort of the liquid stuff where it involves hedge funds, CTAs? Um, what are some of the questions that you that you ask yourself? Well, the first thing is to look at what what do we want to accomplish here. I mean, what what's the aim? And no, making money is is not the aim. It's too too simple. Uh, usually, you have either you're looking at some so some low risk capital preservation strategies in the long run, uh, or you're looking for capital um, building, wealth building kind of strategy. So you have to decide what you want to do. You want to have a high risk portfolio. You want to have something long term. Are you trying to uh, structure something for a family office that uh, intends to, to stay here in five generations for now? How much risk do you really want to take in order, in order to get some money? What kind of building blocks do you need? How do they fit together? How much of each type of building blocks might, might you need? Maybe you need some high risk blocks, some low risk blocks, combine different different strategies. It's always a risk to to look too much at things you're overly familiar with. Mm. Like if you're really into trend following, well, then you analyze 10, 15, 20 trend following shops and you invest in the best ones, but you're still just in trend following in that case. Maybe you want to be in trend following, but maybe you shouldn't only have that, right? So you need to learn about multiple types of strategies, multiple ideas, and be open to, to new types of ideas. In my experience, there are usually new areas, new types of strategies, both liquid and illiquid, that come up from time to time that might at first sound a bit strange, mm. something we don't really know about, but maybe this is actually a rising opportunity for a while. Sure. sure. So, yeah, no, I... keep an open mind and, and look at a lot of different options. Sure. And I know it, that was a very broad question, so so uh, forgive me about that. But one question that is maybe not so uh, broad, but but also I think quite relevant, and that is when you as an investor look at systematic strategies and, and probably look at the ones you have invested in, how do you detect, uh, because this is a question that I get from, 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 from the listeners often, and that is, you know, how, how do you detect if a manager's strategy has stopped working? And it goes back to the point about, is trend following dead? You know, there's obviously going to be times where uh, things look like they've stopped working, but they may not be. But how do you really determine when it stopped working? And and I don't mean trend following as a concept. I just mean, you know, a, a particular strategy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if the returns are not really what you think they're supposed to be, then you need to have a chat with the manager. You need to get an explanation and see if it's a good one or not. Maybe the manager is changing something. Uh, maybe there's something unexpected happening. Maybe there's just something in the market that you weren't really aware of how that impacts. And you say, take something like the uh, the near zero yield environment that has created quite a few problems for for the uh, future space in general. Mm. Maybe there's some factor that you're not aware of, and you need to get a good explanation from the manager. Now, if if you're really convinced that the results are off, the results should not be like this. I mean, everyone can have a loss, but maybe there's a loss in a period where you think there shouldn't be a loss. And you ask the manager about it, and he doesn't have a good explanation for it, then maybe you should be careful. Maybe he's right, maybe he's not. But if you're not comfortable with it, then exit. Do something else. Mm. Always understand what's going on. And never accept you know, the old-style black box explanation. Don't worry. Just sit down and trust me, and give me a year, and I'll fix it. <laughs> Real explanations. Sure. And, and talking about explanations and, and questions and so on and so forth, I mean, you've been part of many uh, due diligence uh, meetings, I'm sure, and, and calls o- over your uh, period, both, uh, you know, people looking at you perhaps and, and you looking at other people. Mm-hmm. But but are there anything that you've found that um, investors really should be asking uh, their, the managers they look at and, and which perhaps they're not really asking, uh, you know, often enough? I mean, is there anything in particular you found which is really important to get a, a good debate on uh, as as part of of, of uh, looking at a manager. Well, I, I find too often that people are, are a bit scared of asking too much question. Mm-hmm. 
uh, there's always this perception that the guy in front of me has so many secrets and it would be impolite to ask about them. But it's no harm in asking. And sure. besides, if you don't get an answer, you better have a good reason why you don't get an answer. <laughs> I mean, say, for instance, ask for something like, hey, show me some trade charts. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see some, some positions where you, where you enter and exit and, and why. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of these kind of things that, that you can get explanations for. If they say that, you know, we have this, we, we, we combine these this two strategies or two time horizons or something, well, okay, what's the attribution to each? Uh, how about the attribution per market, per long short, per, per, per sector? You can get into a lot of these details and you'd be surprised how many of the really big, the really great famous asset managers, many of them that you had on, on this call who would give you the answer. It's just that most people don't ask them. Sure. Uh, most good managers will give you a good answer to those kind of questions. Yeah. Now, they will invite you to come and sit by the screen. I'll show you everything. Mm. Okay, not the source code, but <laughs> a lot of things. Sure. Well, let's jump to the final topics uh, of, of, of our conversation today, which is more the, the general and fun stuff now that we've been so busy talking about, you know, sure. system, systems and, and statistics and all of that. You have been doing this for a, for a while. Uh, it's, it's probably more a, a job to you than anything else. But why do you keep doing what you do? What, what motivates you? It's fun. I like doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to be a reason to do things, right? I mean, it's, like I used to say, I mean, life's too short to be stuck in a crappy job all day. Uh, most of your life you spend working in one way or another. Do you really want to be sitting in a, in a, in a cubicle somewhere and yelling at people in teleconferences? <laughs> you know, they might give you a nice title, you feel important in the company for a while, but, you know, if there's something you want to do for 20 years or 30, 40, I don't know what, then, then fine. If you like it, then fine. But in my view... Having a bit of fun, liking what you do is important. As you know, I, I do a lot of different things, from writing books, uh, I, I manage money in, in quite a lot of different ways. Uh, I have my, my website where I, I regularly I upset people, of course. I uh, publish various uh, analytics. I automate our, um, our, our futures analytics report on the website and these kind of things. And I have fun doing it, yeah. and, I can, and I can. I have the freedom to do things. and. I do what I think is fun. Sure, sure. That's important. Sure. Now, if you're going to recommend a book other than the ones you've written to people why, who Why want, would I do that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to people who want to improve their trading. So let's stay with sort of the, the finance, the trading theme for, for a little bit here. Mm -hmm. What books would you have made a big impact on you? It may be one, it may be a couple. Are there any one that springs to mind? Uh. Starting with what made an impact on me, then we have to go back a little bit in time. Sure. Uh, then we're back to to, uh, to Sweden, to Gothenburg again. Uh, I read, of course, a lot of trading books back then, but mm -hmm. uh, most of all, I think Jack Schwager's uh, earlier books had a big impact on me back then. Sure. Uh, that's actually the, the, the reason. The Market first... Wizards books, you mean? No. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Primarily the Market Wizards book. I, I like his other books too, but the Market Wizards book, uh, the two, two first ones in particular... Yeah. Uh, they had a big impact on me back in back in the must be mid nineties, I guess. Sure, sure. Which is the reason I, I pursued him for the uh, maybe you saw the back of my first book is a blurb from him, a uh, statement from from Jack. Uh, I was very happy to manage to track him down and, and get him to do that afterwards, since sure. he was a reason. He was one reason anyway I got into the business in the first place. Sure. Um, another book just to mention, but it's not necessarily because of a great book, but. Since you asked what had the impact on me, mm -hmm. on an airport in London, I believe, some, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, I found a book called um, something like Create and Manage a Hedge Fund, something okay. along that line, okay. uh, which I bought. And I think that kind of opened my eyes to begin with to the fact that, hey, you know what? I can start a hedge fund. <laughs> so that, that was a great buy. It's one of those big, thick, heavy books, of course. Sure. More recent books. Um, I like the um, the quite recent book by uh, Katie Kaminsky uh, called uh, mm, Trend Following. Following with Managed Futures. Yes, thank you. Sorry, Katie. Uh, I should have known that. <laughs> that uh, is a great book. And of course, yes. Katie has been a guest on the show here. So uh, so by all means, people should go back and, and listen to that episode. 
Absolutely. And uh, let me see, other recent book, well, uh, Gary Antonacci wrote a good book this year about uh, momentum strategies as well. It's quite different from mine, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very good book and very, di- very different from mine. So I think they are good complements because they cover from very different perspectives. And who was that who wrote that? I didn't get... Gary Antonacci. Okay. It is called June Momentum. Okay. What else? I'm glancing at my bookshelf, but it's too far away for me to read the title. So I guess I have to... That is fine. You gave a couple of Um, uh, good suggestions. And if you have more, you can always email them. I'll make sure we'll put it on the... uh, on, on, on the show notes page for this. Oh, well, uh, let me throw one thing out there, yeah, though. I would sure. say that, in, generally speaking, just generally speaking, yeah. you find more value in reading a programming book than a trading book, generally speaking. There's some great trading books and there's some bad programming books, but most people read too many trading books and too few programming books. Okay. I've never, re- I've never read a programming book myself, I have to admit, so maybe I should do that. <laughs> I'll give you some pointers. Okay, good. Now, what's been your biggest failure in your career? Andreas. Ooh. Uh, should I take my time and write your list? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you thought we were just about to finish now, and then I, I come up with this kind of question. Oh, no, that's a tough one. I don't know. Uh, everyone had failures. You had, everyone had trading losses. I mean, sure. uh, say I was, for instance, I was fully loaded in, in, uh, in, in Japanese stocks during the, uh, during the tsunami, for instance. Uh, that was not a very fun day. Sure. Uh, Japan was the hottest place in the, in the uh, uh, hottest stock market in the world, and suddenly we have a tsunami and a nuclear accident, and there was no fun losses on that. Sure. You know, most of these things seem like the end of the world when, when they happen, but you know, give it a year, you, you, you recover, you come back, and it doesn't seem as big anymore. But you always have these incidents that seem like the end of the world when they occur. Yeah. Oh, that's very true. Now, can you, uh, you, you, you alluded to a little secret of yours earlier on, but, but I'm going to ask you for another one. And that is, is there a fun fact you can share about yourself? Something that even people, and I don't mean your wife, but people who knows you <laughs> may not know about you. You have to give me some preparation for this kind of question. I know, uh, but it, you know, it, then it would be scripted. It would be boring, wouldn't it? So, uh, you know, take your time, at least three well, seconds. I don't know. I, uh, I it could be a talent. Do you have like a hidden talent that, you know, maybe you sing like Pavarotti when you're in a Pavarotti when you're in having a well, shower? I don't know. At the risk of, uh, of uh, st- continuous stereotypes, but I, I, I did once uh, walk into a, a chess tournament uh, as the only non-club player and walk and walked home with a prize. Uh, of course, it was a small town and not that many players, but it still annoyed everyone who was a club player that sure. the, the, the guy who was there to fill out the, uh, the, the list of people walked home with a prize. I also used to be a pretty good computer game player, but who was it a long time ago? I had time for that. So a secret hidden talent of I'm chess. Not, I'm not really sure how secret any of those okay. things are, but um, yeah, do what you will with it. Sure. Now, uh, you mentioned you have a, a, a son, and um, I think yep. it was a son, yeah? Yep. And And so... If you could pass on just one of your own skills to your son, what would that be and, and why? Well, probably not the computer game skill. <laughs> um, oh, come on. This is too difficult questions. <laughs> I know. It's, as soon as it gets personal, Andreas, it starts getting a little bit tough here, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Of course. Of course. What has served you well in your career? What, what kind of... What kind of uh... I'm, I'm, I'm guessing my, my, my inability to conform. Okay. I, I'm, I'm the classic non-conformist. I, I don't like, you tell me there's a certain set of environment and, and rules and things to follow. And again, I'm not talking about the, uh, the actual ones, sure. it laws and these things, but rather, you know, you, you put me in a corporate environment and uh, draw a circle around my, or box around my responsibility areas. Well, if I feel it makes sense to do something outside of that, I will. And if I feel it makes sense to leave that box completely, I will do so. And it's going to be very difficult to keep me there. People like that, people like me, are often very difficult to uh, to manage. If you are a manager, uh, of course, that doesn't apply to any future employers who I might sure, of quit course. my job after I lost all my money. <laughs> anyway, but, yes, but I, I believe, to be honest, uh, to, to, to be to be serious, I, I think it's an important skill not to um, not to accept the nonsense in life, but rather make up your own rules, make up your own reality, and refuse to accept sure. whatever is pushed upon you and when your son grows a little bit older i'm sure you will play this segment for him 
when he makes up his own rules at home All and you right. don't agree with them, then so at least exactly what I say. he has evidence on his side, right? <laughs> Daddy, <laughs> Daddy said I should do this, right? <laughs> I guess so. Now, I, I, I said earlier today uh, when we spoke that, you know, it's uh, important to ask uh, a lot of questions and the right questions and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to turn a little bit on myself uh, at the very end here and, and just ask you whether there's anything you think we've missed today in our conversation, something you want to to bring up from, from your books, from your trading, uh, just to make sure that I do justice to, to you and, and, and your firm. No, I think I think you've pretty much, pretty much covered it. Good. Yep. That was easy. Yeah. Now, as we uh, wrap up, I want to thank Eurex, uh, the exchange, for sponsoring today's uh, episode. And as many of uh, our listeners uh, will know, um, you know, Eurex is a great place to go if you're a systematic trader because there's lots of liquidity around. And especially in times of volatility like we see at the moment, it's certainly one of uh, the favorite exchanges for, for many systematic uh, traders. But before we finish our conversations completely, um, Andreas, can you tell me a little bit about where people should go if they want to learn a little bit more about your books or your activities as such? Where, where, would you, where should we send them? Sure. Uh, just go to my webpage at uh, followingthetrend.com and you can contact me there and you can read my articles. You can click on my Amazon links and buy my books. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> Very straightforward. Now, from my side, as a little bit of housekeeping, I just want to mention before we finish this uh, episode that you might, as a listener, want to just check your subscription button on your smartphone. Uh, because we don't uh, publish as regularly as we did a little while ago. Uh, sometimes these uh, media players will unsubscribe the podcast. So I encourage you to just go and check that you're still subscribed to the podcast so that you automatically will get all the future episodes. Now, that leaves me to say thank you very much, uh, Andreas. It's been a great conversation, a, a, a bit of a masterclass in, in systematic trading which i really appreciate and and your willingness to to share all of your your insights and being so open about uh you know specifics and and rules so uh if people will go and sure. buy your book which i encourage they should do they will find some some great starting points uh into to this world and of course the latest book is stocks on the move by andreas clino um, and, you know, as you grab that copy, I would also suggest you buy the classical trend following one that Andreas mentioned. And of course, okay. all of the details uh, from this episode, you, the listener, can find on the show notes page on Top Traders and Plugs. So, Andreas, I know we will connect at a later stage, uh, either on a podcast or locally here in Switzerland. So I wish you uh, a great evening and I Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you for having me. All the best. Pleasure. Take Thanks. care. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.